The lights came on then. He had hit the switch with his wrist. The wattage came pouring into the dark bedroom. The shaft of light lay across the bed and he could see them. They were adorable. Michelle had thrown her arm over Sue and they were hugging in their sleep. They were still out of it. Just in case, he pulled the door closed a little bit so they could stay that way and not be woken up blinded and confused. He made his way through the living room into the kitchen. He couldn't believe he was actually doing it. He opened the refrigerator and went into the crisper. He pulled out a lush red apple. When he pulled open the drawer looking for a knife, he found they were all dirty and in the sink. What did he care? He wasn't going to eat it. He grabbed a slightly crusty blade. Crusted with what, he couldn't tell. He cut out a slice and wrapped it in a paper towel. He also wrapped up the rest of the apple and put it back in the fridge's drawer. He clicked off the lights and stepped through the bedroom doorway. Gently, he closed the door behind him. He made his way to his blanket and placed the wrapped slice of fruit, with the peel still on it, under his pillow. Then, he went to sleep. Rob awoke alone in the sunlit room. That was another good sign. They really knew he could be left alone after sunup. He wanted them to go on normally, relatively, and they appeared to be doing so. He vaguely remembered his dreams. They hadn't been outright nightmares. He just saw more through the killer's eyes. He had been awake when Rob went into him. He could feel the strain that the lack of rest was having on the killer. The strain, however, seemed to be making him more on edge and unpredictable. Rob was beginning to feel the stranger's thoughts more when he was in that state. The killer was still coming for him. Rob had felt him on I-10 heading for California. The killer knew where Rob was, and Rob knew where the killer was. There was no room left anymore for any doubt about it. He had figured it out. When the killer was awake and Rob was asleep, Rob could see what he was seeing. When Rob was awake and the killer was asleep, the reverse happened. They seemed to be on opposite schedules whenever the killer did get any rest. When they were both asleep at the same time, they met in some weird limbo dreamland. Rob had only two main plans for the day. The first was to call his mother. It had been several days since they had last spoken, and a thank you for the check was long overdue. Also, he didn't know how long it would be before he got another chance to talk to her again. Sue and Michelle were having a simple breakfast of cereal with banana slices and milk. They said their afternoon good mornings and told Rob to grab a bowl if he was hungry. He didn't feel like eating at that point. He asked what their plans were for the day. They said they were debating calling in sick again. He said that was entirely up to them, but that he would be fine by himself, bathed in bulb light, and not to let him be the reason for their absence. Sue asked what he would do if there was a power outage. He did not know. A candle and a flashlight were surely insufficient for keeping demons at bay. He then said that he would go out. He could see a movie, or hang at a late-night bookstore or coffee house, and then meet them later at work on the bus. Since money was tight, and their jobs were more on the line than they were letting him know, they agreed to go ahead and go on in, but they did so hesitantly. They left for work that evening, and Sue made Rob promise to head out before sundown. He felt like he was in an opposite sketch about vampires. He swore he would be out by nightfall. Dusk came on very quickly, so Rob went ahead and made the phone call. When he picked up the receiver, another dream he'd had the night before was triggered in his memory. He had picked up the same phone, and before he could use it, the receiver had turned into a gelatinous bubble of blood. The bubble had burst in his hand and the blood splattered the floor in his bare feet. More memories came flooding back, all at once. He was in a race car with no flooring, so he had to put his feet down against the asphalt to try and stop the car, Fred Flintstone style. It was speeding, heedlessly, down the unknown road. When he had tried to brake, the soles of his shoes were ripped to bits. He wondered if that ever happened to Fred. Suddenly, everything had been a cartoon. He had been Porky Pig. He saw that there was another Porky Pig-looking passenger in the car with him. There were railroad tracks crisscrossing all around them and beneath them. He had asked his passenger why there uh, 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 were no trains anywhere, and suddenly one came barreling right at them. Just before there was a head-on collision, the train split in half, down the middle, and the two halves zigzagged past them on either side. Trains were speeding by all around them hectically. The two Porkies were holding each other, shivering and chattering their teeth with fear. Then, in a blink... They were hit and exploded into a splash of blood instead of ink and paint. They both suddenly reappeared in a leaf-shaped boat gliding down a river. His passenger had turned into a beautiful buxom blonde girl. There were exotic plants all around them on the shore. There were varying boxes of beautifully wrapped presents budding from them instead of flowers. When the boat would get stuck, he would reach out and grab a giant plastic arrow that was floating along with them and rub it against one of the bows that was in the boat. It would make a very ear-pleasing song and a violin-esque sound. Rob had entirely forgotten about these other dreams until just then. He was resentful of how all of his dreams lately had been invaded. 
He wondered if his own subconscious was even able to go through what it needed to in his sleep, with them constantly being so preoccupied. Maybe it was making him even more tired than he should be. He wanted to have more silly, seemingly pointless dreams like that. The pre-recorded voice came out of the phone informing him that if he would like to make a call, to please hang up and try again. If he needed help, he should hang up and dial the operator. He pushed the hang-up button and got the dial tone again. He dialed his mother's number. Hello? She said on the second ring. Hey, Mom. Rob, where have you been? I've been calling you forever. I must have left 50 messages. I'm sorry, he said. That wasn't like her at all. Sometimes they went weeks without speaking, and she usually tried to play the part of the cool mom. I've been staying at a friend's place. I haven't checked my messages yet. Well, you should have. Why? What's going on? She got straight to the point. I got a call from your father's new wife. I guess she's more like his new ex-wife. Her name is Cheryl, and she says your dad left for the grocery store one night, about a month ago, and never came back. She isn't worried about him lying in a ditch somewhere because this is a habit with him. I remember those days. Anyway, she said he's usually gone for a few weeks at a time, but this time when he comes back, if he comes back, she would serve him the divorce papers. That's great and all, but why are you telling me this? Why are you so desperately trying to get a hold of me? He's not a part of my life anymore, or yours, really. I feel bad for her, but I don't really care. I can't. That was true. Rob was just flat-out numb sometimes when it came to the subject of his father. Because she gave me some horrible news. Well, why is she even calling you? She got my number from information since I saw her in court. Just listen, Rob. Okay. Her baby is dead. She said that to him like she was dropping a bomb, but he felt no impact. After a moment, he said, I'm sorry to hear that. Not to be cruel, though, but why are you so upset about it? How did the baby die? She doesn't know. Nobody knows. There was blood all over the crib, but they never found its little body. Jesus. Despite his ambivalence to those strangers, it painted an awful picture in his head. I know. Your father is something of a suspect. Cheryl, his new wife, right? I remember. Well, she said he left a few days before it happened, and there's no evidence against him, but the police want to question him, and them not being able to track him down is suspicious. Why are they so suspicious if there's no evidence against him? Obviously, his running off isn't uncharacteristic for him. Hell, if he was still there, they should check to make sure an alien hadn't taken over his body. Rob, this is serious, she shouted. He could hear that there were tears in her voice. I'm sorry, I didn't know you were this upset. No, no, it's not that. She sniffled and steadied her voice. There's no direct evidence against him, just circumstantial. Like what? He could sense another bomb about to be dropped. Somehow he knew it wasn't going to be a dud, too. She paused and then said, The police informed Cheryl that one of his other children has disappeared as well. Something clicked in Rob's brain. He stared at the phone blankly, as if he didn't recognize what it was. He could still hear her talking distantly. Oh, this is so awful, she was saying from the tinny-sounding speaker in the earpiece. I don't know exactly why, Rob, but I'm really worried about you. He put the phone back up by his ear and mouth and said in a monotone voice, I'll be fine. I have to go. His thumb then pressed the hang-up button, which was by his ear. Then he set the phone down in its cradle. It did not ring. His mother did not have Sue's number. Rob, feeling like he was in a dream, went into Sue's room and got the book. He was sensing that there was some more validity to the things he had read. Were his father's other children also haunted by the demons? The sun was barely peeking over the horizon, so he grabbed a long-sleeved flannel shirt and the book and headed for the bus that would take him to the bookstore.